We want to welcome you to this convocation. We especially welcome all of the pastors who are here for Dr. Kleinig's class, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday on, on Hebrews and heavenly worship. Um, and we hope and pray that it's uh, been a blessing to be back on campus and, and to be refreshed by Dr. Kleinig's teaching. Uh, for our students, especially our first year students, this is your first Wednesday convocation hour. We figured that with Dr. Kleinig here, uh, we needed to give the opportunity for the whole student body to benefit from, from uh, hearing him and, and what he has to offer. And one of the um, decisions that was made is to uh, have somebody who is an eyewitness to, uh, you know, we talk about the apostles as eyewitnesses of Jesus. Here we have an eyewitness of um, Herman Sasse, a few uh, of our faculty, like Dr. David Scare, is also an eyewitness. Uh, but uh, the, the thing that we have in the blessing of Dr. Kleinig is he actually lived in Australia and, and uh, benefited from the leadership of uh, Dr. Mm -hmm. Herman Sasse. So we are very grateful to have in our midst uh, Dr. John Kleinig, well known to this Fort Wayne um, uh, community and, and, and seminary because of his many visits here uh, over the years and his great scholarship, um, which is certainly available and read widely in our synod through his Leviticus and now his, his um, Hebrews commentary. And we thank you, John, for your close friendship with the seminary and for your bold and, and faithful witness to the wonderful union in the scriptures uh, between the biblical teaching and the worship life of the church. And that's what you see in Dr. Kleinig, this wonderful wedding of um, these two important realities of the biblical text and the worship life of the church. Uh, so he will be speaking to us today in a dialogue, uh, Dr. Um, uh, Pless, uh, one of our Sase experts here on our campus, will be, um, in a sense, facilitating the conversation with Dr. Kleinig on Hermann Sasse, Lutheran confessor, theologian, and churchman, a discussion on Hermann Sasse. Please join me in welcoming Dr. John Kleinig. Class, you will all always have with you not so much Kleinig. Uh, so my remarks are going to be uh, fairly uh, brief, I hope. Uh, Dr. Kleinig can nudge me if I start saying too much here. But you have a handout of key dates in the life of Hermann Zassa, and you might want to use that as kind of a framework for the conversation that we're going to have uh, together here. Uh, this morning. Uh, we're very pleased to have uh, Dr. Kleinig uh, with us. He will tell you a lot of stories about his own connection with Hermann Zasse, uh, both as a student and a pastor. But just a bit about Hermann Zasse's life. We think of him, of course, today as uh, one of the great confessional Lutheran uh, theologians and churchmen in the 20th century, and that he was, but I think it's also important to note that he did not start out in a confessional Lutheran context. Uh, born in 1895, he was born into a, a congregation in, uh, or to a, a family in Thuringia, uh, grew up in a nominally kind of cultural Protestant uh, setting there, uh, as a young man, went to the University of Berlin to study both theology and philology. And when he went to Berlin, the faculty at Berlin was dominated by some of the most prestigious theologians of the early 20th century. Uh, man, men like Adolf uh, Harnock, Adolf Dietzmann, um, uh, and um, Reinhold uh, Schieberg, and... Uh, uh, especially also Phil. Carl Hull and and Vilamovitz. Uh, okay, Morvitz, and and so he was uh, exposed uh, to uh, really what we would call kind of a cultural liberal Protestant uh, theology. Uh, university studies interrupted during uh, the First World War. Uh, he fights uh, in the uh, uh, German army. 
Uh, he is um, part of a cohort that goes into the Battle of Paskendal, and I think only about uh, five or six men in that cohort actually uh, survive, right? Actually, can I come yeah. in there? Um, he uh, was an officer. He uh, uh, had a unit of 160 men, and in the terrible Battle of Paschendal, uh, they went from the trenches and six came back, and he was the one of those six. And that scarred him for his life, for better and for worse. And he said, quite frankly, had two witticisms about it. He said, liberalism died for me that day. <laughs> And the other witticism he had was that this was my first contact with Australians <laughs> and I came out alive. <laughs> because he confronted some of our crack troops in this terrible battle, um, which was the German uh, counterattack after the, we were being forced back. It was the last uh, attack. And... Uh, uh, the other side, if I can just give a plug, yes. um, uh, he was facing one of our most brilliant military strategists, a man by the name of Monash. But that's just an Australian plug. You don't know Australian history. <laughs> okay. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, after the war, he finishes um, his uh, university studies. He's ordained in um, 1920. Um, St. Matthew's Church in Berlin, which incidentally is the same church that... Uh, Paul Tillich was ordained yeah. in, and the same church that um, Diedrich Bonhoeffer would yes. be ordained in a few uh, years later. By the way, with Bonhoeffer and Sasse, there's also a great connection there. Bonhoeffer was 11 years uh, younger than Sasse, but they came from similar backgrounds, both studied at the University of Berlin, uh, both came and to America for an American year studies, and both would be involved uh, together in opposition to national uh, socialism. The break between Bonhoeffer and Sasse would come with the Barman Declaration of 1934. After he uh, finishes his uh, degree, he's married 1924, and then uh, for the academic year 1925, 1926, he comes to Hartford Theological Seminary in Connecticut for a postgraduate year. That year will be very significant. Uh, it's during that year that he will meet a number of American uh, Lutherans, primarily of the old United Lutheran Church in America, the seminary in Philadelphia, where you had men like uh, Henry Eister Jacobs and uh, his son, uh, Charles Jacobs, also Frederick Knubel, who was president of the ULCA at that time, and... Um, and particularly then Theodore Tappert, who will actually try to get Sasa to come and teach at the Mount Airy Seminary in 1939. That plan, however, was forestalled. One, uh, Sasa's earliest book, or book that really is a PC published in 1927, on American uh, Christianity. And that book uh, gives his impressions of the state of Christianity in America uh, in the 1920s, and particularly his observations about uh, the Lutheran uh, churches here. Back in, in uh, Germany, he is involved in the ecumenical uh, movement. Uh, Dr. Kleinig and I were talking a bit after chapel, and I hope he develops this a bit in his uh, uh, comments, that uh, Zasa was an ecumenical confessionalist and a confessional humanist. He took ecumenical responsibility very seriously. He was in by no means a kind of a ghetto Lutheran, but he was speaking uh, always also to the, to the whole church. We see that very early on in his involvement in 1927, Lausanne Conference on Faith and Order. Um, this kind of work will uh, continue really through Sasse's life. Uh, but in uh, 1933, he works with uh, Bonhoeffer, with Georg Mertz, with Wilhelm uh, Fischer on the, on the uh, Bethel uh, Confession. And it's also during that same year that he is called to the University of Erlangen uh, to, the, to the faculty. 1934, uh, refuses to write or to sign the Barman Declaration, 
1936 uh, publishes one of his most uh, significant and in many ways, I think, kind of programmatic books uh, under the, the English title is Here We Stand. And that was translated uh, already in the 1930s by Theodore Tappert and mailed to every Lutheran pastor in the old National Lutheran Council. It was seen as a way of introducing Lutheran theology to a broader American uh, public. In 1945, after the war, uh, he meets uh, John Bacon, president of the Missouri Synod, when Bacon was visiting uh, Germany, and that becomes a lifelong and influential uh, point of contact and influence in so many, uh, in so many ways. 1948, he resigns his membership in the Bavarian church in disappointment and protest over that church entering into the ECED, the uh, Evangelical Lutheran Church uh, in, in Germany, uh, which he deemed to be a unionistic church body. Uh, there's another trail of stories that we don't, I don't have time to go in here, into here today, but about uh, preliminary contacts with Concordia Seminary in St. Louis and the potential of a call there in 1948. But instead, he is called uh, to Emmanuel Lutheran Seminary in Adelaide, Australia, and uh, installed there October 12, 1949. And Dr. Kleining, I'm sure, will fill you in on all the details or many of the details of uh, the Australian uh, chapter, because it is also during this Australian chapter that he, he has increased contacts with Lutherans in the United States, uh, particularly within uh, the Lutheran Church uh, Missouri Synod, uh, invited to come to the campus of this seminary when we were at Springfield as a guest lecturer, had a great love, I think, for this uh, seminary during the Springfield days, and was also awarded an honorary degree uh, from Concordia Theological Seminary in 1967. One of the aspects of the Australian chapter, which Dr. Clonig can speak to, will, would be Sasse's involvement in the merger of two Lutheran church bodies in Australia uh, that resulted in 1966 in the current Lutheran Church of Australia. Uh, Sasse then would live until 1976. He dies uh, in a house fire, actually from fumes, from a space heater, I think, yes. a kerosene heater. Um, if we think about, you know, kind of Sasa's overall contributions, I would suggest there are several areas that you might want to be cognizant of and look at. One is the nature of confession itself. What does it mean to confess Jesus Christ? A second area would be ecclesiology. Uh, it is often said that in the 19th century, the burning question was the question of the church. Uh, Zasa uh, immerses himself into that question. And, and there we see, I think, something really of Zasa's own theological method, uh, which is determined by Article 7 of the Augsburg Confession. It is sufficient for the true unity of the church that the gospel be purely preached and sacraments administered in accordance with uh, the divine word. Certainly the Lord's Supper, his great book on, on Luther's doctrine of the Lord's Supper, was really my first introduction uh, to, to, to Sasa as a college student. This is my body. Uh, that was published uh, in 1950, uh, 1959. Uh, he also was very much involved in articulating what he believed to be a responsible doctrine of the authority of Holy Scripture. And that would be one of the areas that would create no little amount of controversy, and I think sometimes misunderstanding on the part of some of Sasse's uh, opponents. Yeah. But that's kind of a thumbnail sketch of Sasse's uh, life, and so I'm going to uh, turn it over to the one who was actually eyewitness, as I am only a Dutro Sassian. Okay. <laughs> uh, okay, thank you, John, and for that splendid overview. Um, if you hearing that story, uh, uh, you could be rather intimidated because he was a formidable man in his learning um, and in uh, his courage. Um, one of the things you didn't touch on was that he was the first 
uh, theologian, not just Lutheran, to tackle Nazi theology head on. Uh, in 1932, wasn't it? Yeah. Um, the Nazi propaganda chief had issued a uh, uh, pamphlet, a book on uh, German Christianity, which basically said Jesus was not a Jew, he was an Aryan, and um, was reaching uh, uh, and uh, propagated this abomination of, no, this uh, perversion of the Christian faith. Uh, and uh, Zasser uh, pens, as he so often did, a cutting, decisive critique of not, not Nazi uh, uh, polit uh, politics, but Nazi theology. And from that moment on, he was a marked man. And it was a miracle or a number of miracles that he survived uh, the Nazi period and the war. I won't go into that. There's lots of interesting stories there. But one of the most interesting one was because he was an officer in the First World War, um, he had friends in the German army, the Wehrmacht. And uh, the most effective opposition to Hitler uh, came actually from the army. Uh, and that Dietrich Bonhoeffer linked with that particular group in the army in, uh, in an attempt to assassinate Hitler. But the army was not entirely happy with Hitler, to put it mildly. And so uh, when he was in Erlangen, they appointed him as a military chaplain to a military hospital in Erlangen. Now, and that gave him military status, military cover. Uh, the Nazis couldn't touch him because, without getting into trouble with the, uh, uh, the army that they needed at that stage in the war. Okay, I say, he's a formidable man because if ever there was a truth sayer, a person who was prophetic and fierce in advocating the truth, and this, uh, because of this, he fell out with many people. And if you look at his the story of his life, he uh, uh, because he on the other hand he was also a very warm, winsome, imaginative, witty person. Uh, and so he made friends easily and could reach out across all sorts of barriers. But then uh, inevitably, he'd fall out with people because he told the truth. Um, so he's a formidable character. But what people don't realize and what you don't pick up when you read him is his wit. Uh, he was uh, uh, very, very wicked wickedly witty and had a wicked wit and he his one-liners were memorable and I wish I'd written them down but uh, uh, just to give you some idea of the man okay uh, let's say this was one I, I remember one class a hi church history class um, and there were about oh a dozen of us or 15 of us in a fairly small classroom and there was a podium like this, about this size, and it was about as deep as this, and it was enclosed at three sides. And Zasa would come in with a great big pile of books. Uh, he'd clump because, as he said, I lost my feet in the trenches. <laughs> uh, and come in with this great big pile of books, very hardly any of them in English, and in most cases, he wouldn't open a single one. He'd plonk them down and he'd start lecturing, raising his finger or as soon as he hit the door uh, and uh, uh, escape. So on this one occasion, um, a student, a rather cheeky student, uh, uh, decided to test him and to, uh, you know, play a joke on him because he was, uh, you know, would, 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 would make fun of us and tell jokes against our, our expense. And the name of the guy was Hans. And he got into the back of this podium. If you can imagine, it's about this deep. And there's enough for crouching underneath this. And, and Zas would sit like this. Now, he'd rock like this and he'd lift his hand and he'd constantly wave his finger. Uh, and, uh, you know, to emphasize... Uh, everything and everything was emphatic 
uh, and uh, uh, we could barely contain ourselves because he got particularly worked up this day, <laughs> excited. And um, then what Hans would do, as soon as he'd go back, he'd shift the podium, he'd get up a little bit this way. And what did Zossa do? <laughs> So in the course of that lecture, Hans took the podium as far as he dared three times across. And he was over this side when the bell went, rang at the end of the lecture. And Zasa, this is the only occasion it's ever happened. Zasa stopped mid-sentence, very dramatically, pushed back pushed back the chair, and in an exaggerated fashion, he looked down and he said, Hans, you can come out now. <laughs> um, yes, he wasn't at all pompous, or uh, as we say in Australia, uh, up himself, uh, a very humble man, uh, but a truth teller. On another occasion, yeah, oh, I could tell lots of stories, but my fav one of my favourites, okay, um, he would welcome questions. Uh, and, uh, you know, on one occasion, one day, a student said, this may be a stupid question, but, okay, and he made a big point and he said, um, he named, he always called him Mr. Mr. Swa. Uh, uh, only stupid people don't ask questions. There are no stupid questions. And he had the knack of taking questions, which were, you know, could be very superficial and finding something profound in them and making the most of it. Uh, a marvelous ability to think on his feet. And he would never speak from notes. He'd just speak off the cuff. Um, a marvelous memory. But, um, uh, after that had happened, then um, uh, we dared the guy who had asked that question, the next lecture, to ask a uh, what we call a Dol Dorothy Dix, which is a leading question. You know, um, and we thought he, Zussa would not be able to make anything of this. And so the next day, uh, the next lesson, we got into class and, uh, you know, he got going and Kevin, the guy, put up his hand and said, Dr. Zasa, I have a question. And he said, good, what's your question, Mr. Thwa? And he said, look, I've got a girlfriend. Oh, I just said, that's interesting. You've got a girlfriend, yes, and we go to church together. Oh, that's good, that's even better. Uh, and he said, now, uh, we sit together in church, but we were wondering whether it, was, whether it would be right to hold hands in church. <laughs> and Zasa's face set. He raised his bushy eyebrows and put on a fierce demeanor, lifted up his finger, and he said, Mr. Tzwa, it would be very, very wrong for you not to hold hands. <laughs> uh, that was the only occasion when he answered a question with a single sentence. <laughs> um, yes. Uh, uh, yeah, an, a, another little incident of a different character. Um, because he was not only a very, very learned man, you know, he was widely read. He, he didn't just read theology, he read science, he read philosophy, uh, he was a historian, he read dogmatics, uh, uh, amazingly uh, widely read. Um, but uh, what doesn't always come through in his writings is, is that he's also a brilliant pastor. Uh, but not a mushy pastor. Uh, you know, he could just very simply get to the heart of the matter. He had that gift. Um, I remember one occasion, um, 
after lecture, I accompanied him as he was going from the lecture hall through to the library, carrying his stack of books. And uh, I sidled up to him uh, and wanted to seek his advice. Now, I'd noticed that something was happening in my life that was, uh, and it happened particularly when I came to seminary, is that when I'd try to pray or meditate, my, my mind, which always wanders and races around the place, would just go this way, that way, everywhere. And particularly in church and listening to a sermon. And the funny thing about it was that my mind would not just wonder when it was a bad sermon because it was bad and boring, but sometimes the best sermons would, would, would get my mind racing and I'd be distracted by it. And I assumed this was a bad thing and I uh, was coming from the other spirit. Uh, so I uh, was walked with Zasa and said, look, uh, Zasa, uh, Dr. Zasa, I've got a problem. And Zasa stopped, faced me, and he said, good. <laughs> and it's the first time I ever heard anybody say a problem was good. He says, good. What's your problem, Koenig? And I said, look, uh, whenever I attend church, listen to a sermon, I seem to be distracted by the devil. And it's, it's, it's really very difficult to, when I try and meditate or pray, uh, it's hard for me to follow. I seem to have this, the devil seems to distract me. He looked at me and said, the devil, he said, perhaps it is the Holy Spirit. And then he walked away. <laughs> In its own way, that was one of the most helpful bits of spiritual counsel I've ever received. As some of you may know, because I uh, speak about it in my book, Grace Upon Grace. Okay, a very witty, incisive man, but he could also be devastating. He could put people down with a uh, one-liner if he chose to. And sometimes he made enemies because of his one-liners. Uh, he was very adept at, uh, uh, he's not no, he's, he, he was basically, if you like, a theological journalist. He's, he's, he, he, he comes to his own best of all in writing letters and writing short articles. Okay, uh, so much. Oh, another story. Okay, because uh, lots of this other stuff you can pick up elsewhere, but these kinds of stories um, you, 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 uh, are not recorded. Another day... It was church history class, again, early church. And uh, we had two guys in our class who were uh, joke tellers. You know, they had an amazing memory for jokes. And they'd say, uh, have you heard the latest? And they'd tell a joke. And it was good to get them together because they'd fire each other off. <laughs> joke one, joke two, and, and, you know, that kind of stuff. It's, that's an art that's been lost, I think, that, that joke telling. They weren't just joke tellers, but they were connoisseurs. Am I speaking too fast? Can you hear me at the back? Okay. Uh, uh, they were connoisseurs of limericks. Uh, and th uh, this day, uh, Peter, who was uh, uh, in the class, who always come into class late and would always sit at the very back corner. That was his position. And if anybody went there, they got into trouble. Uh, he was a second career guy had come into class and he had just discovered a delicious limerick. It's a little bit on the rude side, uh, as the best limericks are. Now, <laughs> and for just 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 to fill you in historically, because it was uh, it, you need some background to it. Uh, Titian is a great Italian painter, and he used to like painting nude women or semi-nude women. And rose madder is a particular shade, uh, rose-coloured shade, which he would use then to get the flesh tone. And the limerick goes like this. You better listen for the punchline. While Titian was mixing rose madder, his model stood perched on a ladder. Her position to Titian suggested fruition. So he mounted the ladder and had her. <laughs>
<laughs> I shouldn't really tell it here, but it's part. <laughs> Apologies to your dear ladies. <laughs> um, now, um, uh, he'd written it out on a piece of paper. And, you know, we were on tables like this, and then one person read it, and uh, then when Zasa didn't seem to be looking, you'd slip it, and then it would go. And then it came to the end of the row, and you had to get it across the aisle, so somehow underhand, you'd signal, and it was doing the rounds. And uh, Zasa was talking about the persecution of the early church in North Africa. And he was telling a story about how the secret police, the Roman secret police, came to visit the house of one of the bishops in North Africa. Um, and uh, the point uh, they uh, wanted, ostensibly, they wanted to confiscate the scriptures, but what they wanted to do was to uh, uh, confiscate uh, the offerings, the money that had been collected. Okay, so... They uh, came to this bishop and they asked him, where do you store your treasures? And he said, the bishop said, I have no treasures. Uh, I have no money. Um, but he had received word um, that the police were on the way. And so he um, put a, his collection of heretical writings, writing of her her heretics, in what he thought was the most obvious place where the police would look. But Zosa said, they turned the house upside down, emptied the beds, emptied the cupboards. And meanwhile, whenever they came to the room where this chest was with the books in it, the bishop would stand as if he was defending it. And finally said, the penny dropped. And the policeman said, what have you got there? And he pointed straight to the guy who had the limerick. <laughs> there was a stunned silence, <laughs> followed by uproarious laughter and we never actually discovered whether it was a sheer accident. It could have been that, but I think he jolly well knew. Um, yeah, on a more, yeah, I've been yeah. talking, yes. yes. No, no, great. This is, this is what you want? This is what we want. I okay. mean, there, there are all kinds of uh, Zasa stories that I've heard from uh, uh, from from John Kleinig and and from uh, others, his, his wit. Uh, I was telling John one that I had heard, uh, uh, I think probably from uh, Lowell Green, who was yeah. at uh, Erlangen as Erlangen. a student in the uh, post-war years, and uh, Zasa was the American or the liaison to for, to the American Army uh, for the denazification of the university, and. Um, so the question was put to him, what about your colleague, Dr. Paul Althaus? And uh, Zasa responded, well, Herr Dr. Althaus could not possibly be a Nazi because as a good Melanctonian, he could neither affirm or deny anything. Althaus <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, was not amused. Uh, and uh, there was another <laughs> witticism about Althaus um, he was a very vain man who used to give out photographs of himself. Um, <laughs> Get some colours back there. <laughs> you didn't say that. No, I didn't say that. <laughs> uh, and uh, uh, and he, he retained, and even to middle age, and so a very boyish uh, 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 face. And as I said, put down about that was that he never lost his confirmation face. <laughs> in other words, he never grew up. <laughs> uh, it's better in German than in English. <laughs> yeah. Um, we have a little time uh, left, and there might be some uh, questions and, and, yes. uh, from, from um, our audience. But before we go there, uh, you've lived now as a pastor in Lutheran Church of Australia. You're an heir of this uh, wonderful legacy yeah. of Hermann Zassa.
talk a little about his theological legacy. Why why is it that uh, you think Sasa is still worth reading and uh, reflecting on today, and particular aspects maybe of his work that uh, that stand out for you? Yes. Um, one thing that I'd emphasize is that he deals with uh, not so much the topics of academic uh, uh, of the university and academic theology, but he deals with real practical issues. Um, in the uh, 60s, when I was in seminary, uh, the Pentecostal movement had barely raised its head. And uh, he, he, he's quite a prophetic figure, and he said, uh, he said again and again, uh, the unfinished uh, part of church doctrine history is the whole third article. Uh, he says, you look at any dogmatics, they don't do justice to the third article. Uh, and that all the most important topics that would be at the forefront in um, uh, the end, the second half, the latter, latter part of the 20th century and 21st century would have to do with the, the third article, the Holy Spirit, the gifts of the Spirit, uh, scripture, inspiration, uh, ministry, church, uh, sacraments, uh, means of grace, all that kind of stuff. And he uh, gave me as an assignment to do some work on the uh, Assemblies of God, which were just beginning to come in Australia. And so at that stage, uh, uh, he steered in that direction, and I had to come to grips with uh, the whole Pentecostal theology of uh, the charismata. Um, now, that was typical of him. He wouldn't go to what was fashionable, the topics that everybody was engaged with, but he was trying to anticipate, and he had the remarkable ability to, ability to anticipate what would be important in the future. Um, okay, and uh, he was ecumenical in a way that is people don't realize. Uh, he had contacts right from Cardinal Bayer, who was uh, uh, second in charge in the in the Vatican and was the brains behind the uh, Second Vatican Vatican Council, uh, through to uh, evangelical Anglicans. No, uh, that people would write off as being fundamentalists. Uh, uh, he uh, had this um, enormous reach and. There's two things that stri uh, uh, strike me in addition to that, uh, and it wasn't a superficial understanding, uh, or oh, just, just on the Second Vatican Council. Uh, it was going on when I was at seminary, and it gave Zasa a new lease of life uh, because already before reports of what was happening there hit the media, he would get a letter from Cardinal Bayer or his secretary up to date, so much so that the Catholic bishops, whom you all knew, would ask him, what's happening in Rome? <laughs> huh. And he was able to brief them and quite accurately. And he saw that this was m probably the most, he says, this was the most momentous event in the 20th century, Vatican II. Um, uh, not just for the Catholic Church, but for the whole of Christendom. And he had great hopes for it. Um, finally disappointed, and particularly because of its universalism, finally. Uh, but uh, uh, he had that ecumenical curiosity and reach and understanding. Um, there are two things that stick in my mind that I learned from him. This is ecumenically. One is that he says again and he says again and again to us as students, we shouldn't just read our friends because they agree with us and we agree with them. We can't learn very much from them, but we need to read our enemies. They teach us far more than the people who are on the same page as us. Uh, to be widely read and to understand people from a different position. Uh, they challenge us, they challenge us to think. They show us where uh, we are somehow lacking in our understanding of the faith or the scriptures or church history. Uh, and in that respect, he gave a, 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 a second dictum, which is that before you dare 
to criticize somebody, make sure you understand them. And not just understand them uh, in a narrow sense, but make sure you understand them within their own frame of reference. So you've got to step in their shoes and, uh, in a sense, read them and listen to them, not as Lutherans, but as, say, Presbyterians or Catholic or Pentecostals. So step in their shoes, understand them in their own terms, and then you can uh, uh, criticize them or engage with them in a measured way and not from a point of view of ignorance. Now, um, that has stuck with me ever since, and it's something that I've tried to practice very hard in my life, which is what I'd call, uh, contrary to what's fashionable in academia, a hermeneutic of appreciation. You don't say, what's wrong with this person? What do I have to criticize here? But what is right? Uh, and thus I'd say again and again, uh, to take note of uh, new movements within Christendom because he, he said when the Orthodox Church forgets one of the articles of faith, when it no longer practices them, it will be rediscovered by some fringe group, very often a sectarian group. And we need to learn from that because they show us what we have forgotten and what we need to reclaim. Take, for example, the Pentecostal movement. Um, the first part of my dogmatics was basically we never got to the third article when, because we concentrated mainly on first article and second article, no third article. However, when I got out, when I graduated, all the basic problems were third article problems and particularly the whole issue of the Pentecostal movement. Um, so uh, to take note of fringe movements that rise because they are... Uh, uh, discover and emphasize in a one-sided kind of way something that the uh, church Catholic, the small Catholic church, has forgotten. And we can learn a great deal from them, and we must note this. And in addition to this, he'd, he, he would emphasize. So uh, uh, don't just look at the big boys, uh, uh, the big movements, the big churches. Look at those little ones. They, they're, they're significant. You can learn a lot from them. Um, the other thing that he emphasized ecumenically was that uh, all the great movements in church history are ecumenical. They cut across all denominations at the same time. Uh, and it's funny, you know, the same questions seem to rise uh, from all the way from orthodoxy through to heretical groups. All the great movements are ecumenical. And they need to be treated and understood ecumenically. So take, for example, uh, the ordination of women. Now, that was never on the agenda until, say, 50 years ago, I suppose, and uh, then became one of the pressing issues. Uh, the whole sexual issue at the moment is not just ecumenical across the denominations, theologically, but is across the whole of our society. And it's a how... Uh, those two quite often correspond, you know, the big movements across the churches and the big movements in society, and they interact with each other. So uh, to understand uh, that you can't uh, isolate yourself from the big movements in the church, across the churches, you need to take note of them. And then he gave, give advice. He says, look, there's three, there's, uh, Two ways, basically, you deal with a movement across the church that is uh, not e exactly right, is false teaching. Uh, you can quarantine the body from it. Um, and he'd point to Missouri Synod and he said uh, from its very uh, uh, creative early beginnings, uh, basically it tended to set in cement at a particular period. And uh, they ceased to buy, and he, he went to the seminary library in St. Louis, and he said they were not, no longer buying the books written by other uh, theologians that they should be buying. And even if they had them there, they weren't being read. Uh, uh, he said you can quiet, try and quarantine, say, a denomination or church from false doctrine. But the problem is, if you quarantine it, it becomes even more vulnerable to it. Uh, uh, 
And the analogy that he used was of a body. You can quarantine the body from infection, but the problem is then the body becomes more vulnerable to infection. It loses its antibodies. And he says, once a disease, heresy is a disease, comes into the body of a church, it needs to take its full course before the church can develop antibodies. Hmm. Um, so if you, if you apply that, uh, that makes good sense to me and helps me in understand lots of things that are going on and not to try and uh, uh, put, uh, you know, send, put certain questions out of consideration. Um, if I can just illustrate two cases, the whole issue of the ordination of women is ecumenical and is, is, is affecting all denominations in some way. Um, uh, in a sense, you can try and silence debate or discussion on this, uh, but that doesn't help very much if you silence discussion. Um, uh, that needs to take its full course. People need to see the consequences of this uh, before it can be turned around. And that's the same with the whole sexual agenda. So uh, uh, that's a very helpful dictum for, of his uh, about uh, the way you approach movements in church history. Uh, oh, just one other thing. The, one of the things that strikes me, uh, even though he was f a, a truth teller like no other, he, he was very generous in his appraisal of other people. He had a real generosity of spirit. And occasionally he laments the fact that he's always got to go into negative mode because that didn't come naturally to him. His natural tendency was to see what was good rather to, than to see what was bad. A generous heart. We have a few minutes left. And one mm. thing that might be helpful before uh, we end today is for you to talk a little about the two groups in two Lutheran groups in Australia, the background, and how Sasso was really a catalyst for bringing those two Lutheran groups together in 1966. Could you do that? Yes, um, Sasso was not enamored by uh, size, magnitude, um, and he said the significance of a particular church or denomination doesn't depend on its membership. Uh, he says the most significant things happen in the lit smallest congregations, the smallest churches. Um, you know, when he, basically when his situation in Erlangen became intolerable, that's another whole story, he was looking to come over to either Australia or, uh, no, to America or Australia. He was most drawn to the LCMS and to his dying day he said the future of confessional Lutheranism uh, stands or falls with LCMS, and I'd like to lay that on you. You're far more important uh, for confessional Lutheranism, but also for the church Catholic, the whole of Christendom, than you ever imagine. Uh, if you lived where I live, you would understand that, but that's uh, by the way. Uh, uh, what was I talking about? The two Lutheran bodies. Oh, the two Lutheran bodies. Okay, then... Uh, 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 there was a, a call didn't come to St. Louis, but then at the same time that he was exploring options, he got a call to Adelaide um, and to one of the two synods that was there, the UELCA, that's my synod, which was aligned with um, over here with the old ALC. My that's synod. That's your. Yeah. And not <laughs> only that, but uh, 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 one of the great heroes or uh, fathers of that, uh, uh, synod was Willem Lui. Yeah. And uh, Filmer, August Filmer, two great Lutheran theologians that you need to understand. Um, mm -hmm. uh, I would just interject one thing here. It was in, in the uh, year at Hartford. Yes. Um, Zasa read Wilhelm Leia's three books about the church. church. And he says, that is the book that made me a confessional Lutheran. That's right. And, and he... Uh, he would have his own set of criticisms of Leia. Oh, he had criticisms of everybody, including yeah. himself. <laughs> but but he uh, but he did see Leia as one who kind of braved the climate of the 19th century yeah. without becoming sectarian, remaining a very Catholic spirit, and uh, uh, embodying uh, both Lutheran confession and, um, and and practice. Yeah, because he wasn't just interested in doctrine, but he was interested in worship. 
sacraments, mm -hmm. and he was interested in mission, and he was one of the most pastoral uh, of any, I mean, if there is a model pastoral theologian, it, for me, it is, is Willem Lund. Um, so uh, there was the one church, the, uh, the UELCA, aligned with ALC and aligned with uh, Bavarian Lutheran Church. Uh, we're in fellowship with that. And then there was the other one, the, the ELCA, which was basically came out of Leipzig, the Leipzig mission, and was aligned with Missouri here. Uh, the first church was in, uh, uh, in LWF. The other one was not in LWF. Now, Zasa came to, to uh, Australia partly because he felt the call uh, to work towards the union of these two churches. He could see what was valuable and important in both of them and that uh, their two heritages needed to come together to uh, complement each other, uh, each other's weaknesses, and for a united Lutheran witness, not just to Australia, but he, uh, as a historian, could see the strategic importance of Australia we are a European outpost in Southeast Asia. And his vision was that Australia would be the island, island as in uh, England and Ireland, of Southeast Asia and would be the base for the conversion and the mission of the church to Asia. Just as the Irish monks then were responsible for uh, the planting of the church in England and in Germany and in Northern Europe. Uh, so he worked towards, and his passion was to bring those two churches together, not just in a political union, but in a confessional union, where nothing was put under the carpet, but issues were thrashed out. And uh, he was the leading, uh, one of the leading figures in that uh, process of union. Um, and you can read the results of it in our Theses of Agreement. But it was not, uh, uh, and he used, the, if you kind, the methodology of the uh, formula of Concord. You'd, you'd, you wouldn't deal with big issues. You'd deal with one issue at a time that was controverted, uh, and you'd deal with it scripturally and confessionally in order to get a consensus. And uh, one of the things that he emphasized was that consensus is not the same as uniform uh, uh, understanding or uniform even theology. Within a common confession, you could have a, a, a number of different points of view that were necessary to complement each other. Um, so for, oh no, I better not, yes, we're running out of time. But it, it just briefly, in understanding of church, uh, you have the old Missourian understanding of church as basic con basically congregation. Is church congregation? Is that right? Yeah, absolutely right. But church is more than just local congregation. Each congregation is part of the heavenly congregation, the heavenly assembly. And uh, the church is not just local, but it is also regional and uh, uh, worldwide. Uh, so you have church in that broader sense in which there's only one church, Ephesians uh, around the world, uh, as well as many congregations. Now, both of those emphases need to uh, supplement each other. Uh, and if they don't, the church runs into problems. That was part of his methodology. Mm -hmm. uh, and say, for example, as far as ministry is concerned, uh, he followed the same thing. There's, uh, there's not total sort of uh, everybody on the same page, but everybody shared the same confession of faith. That was his goal. And that's a goal that you uh, need to pursue too, uh, ecumenically, uh, uh, in your relationship with other Lutheran bodies, uh, and also with non-Lutheran bodies. Can I just alert you to something that uh, I'm finding that most conf many confessional Lutherans are not found these days in Lutheran churches? Can I repeat that? Many confessional Lutheran pastors, theologians, lay people are not members of any Lutheran church, but members of other churches. That's the old denominations are breaking down as confessional bodies. There's 
new configurations. God's doing something new. And uh, the old confessional bodies are breaking down in the mission fields, which means that we need to negotiate a new reality uh, uh, historically and culturally and into the future. I think this is a good point to uh, wrap things up because we are at the top of the hour. I will put in a plug on the basis of what Dr. Klonig said about finding Lutherans in other places for a convocation we're going to have here on Wednesday, October 24, a conservative Anglican theologian by the name of J.D. Cook, who wrote a wonderful thesis at the Humboldt University in Berlin on law and gospel as basis and boundary for theology. And when you read this, uh, you think you're reading a Lutheran because you are. You are he, reading a Lutheran. Because he just happens to be, you know, an Anglican uh, in an Anglican church, but he's he's confessionally he's Lutheran. Confessionally Lutheran. Yeah. And and we have all kinds of opportunities, I think, to engage in this kind of uh, interchange uh, uh, today. And uh, Zasa is certainly a very good uh, role model, I think, uh, yeah. for us there. Uh, once again, I want to thank you, my good friend, Dr. Kleinig, for being here with us. Together. On behalf of all the, the pastors and students here, uh, this was a unique experience uh, to be able to, uh, to listen and to hear some of these uh, incidents and in a sense get a greater insight into one of the the men that the Lord used uh, powerfully in the, the life of the church in the 20th century. So again, we thank Dr. Kleinig for being present here. Everybody's dismissed for lunch. Yeah.